Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. Joe Gavin was here, the missionary Joe Gavin was here. He said he likes preaching down here, and I do too. I, I just, I, I love being down and with everybody on the floor. It just kind of makes me feel more like I'm teaching than preaching, and I'm more of a teacher anyway, anyway than a preacher. So, so we're going to, before I get into the sermon, I'm going to put a plug in real quick. This is my sales pitch. So we're starting what we're calling our Cornerstone Series next week. It's a 13 week series um, based on Jesus' actions from the time just before he came into Jerusalem all the way till he left, ascended, and the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. And Peter preached the first, uh, his first great sermon um, on the day of Pentecost, and which started the early church. It's a really in depth series. We're going to harmonize the Gospels. Who knows what it means to harmonize? Blend, bring together, yes. If you read the Gospels independently, as powerful as they are, they don't give the full story of what happened individually the whole last week of Jesus' life. And so much happened the whole last week of Jesus' life. You have to put them together, you have to harmonize them. For instance, one of the great scenes of the crucifixion is when Jesus is getting his hands and feet nailed, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. That's only in one of the Gospels. So if you don't read that particular Gospel, you miss a very important part. So what we're going to do is we're going to harmonize them and take you on a journey, a chronological journey, a harmonized journey from Bethany, where Jesus was anointed, all the way through to the end. Now, it's funny because what started me on all this, I think it was last year, I, had, I was at work at my old job, and one of my co-workers, your sister-in-law, came up to me, and she, she's an atheist. She was raised um, Christian, but she's an atheist. She came up to me, and she said, I, I don't understand why you Christians celebrate Easter according to the sun, or according to the calendar, the Roman calendar. She's like, if it's resurrection, why don't you celebrate it after Passover? Because that's when it happens. And I said, absolutely, I agree, I thought about that, but, you know, I'm not sure why. So I did some research, uh, I remember, I think it was two years ago, you shared some paperwork, I either think you emailed it to me on, on Easter, and I did some research over the last couple of years, and I thought to myself, you know, it's, it would be so cool if we celebrated the resurrection when it truly happened, and that's three days after the Passover. So that's what we're going to do this year. We're not going to ignore traditional Palm Sunday or traditional Easter. We are going to have services. Um, we're going to focus on the prophetical pieces during those services of Palm Sunday, which is next week, and then Easter the following week. However, on Sunday night, we're going to be talking about Easter and resurrection and kind of why we celebrate Easter and why we don't call it Resurrection Sunday. So pastor is going to bring a really good message about that in more detail why we are doing this specifically. So just encourage you guys to, to come out and, and join the series. It's a really good series. We'll have booklets with, you know, with notes in them. Everything will be presented really nicely. Hopefully we'll get them printed this week. Um, Ink Plaza is helping us out. So just kind of be in prayer for the whole series because it's really going to be powerful and it's really going to kind of open our eyes. And, and what we're going to do is the week of, of Passover, traditional Passover, the Jewish Passover, is going to be our resurrection week. And we're going to focus on everything Jesus did that week. It's going to be a, a spring crusade and we're going to be here every night, even Monday. We're going to be here and we're going to be doing some interesting things that week. We're going to have our Last Supper play as we normally do. Our youth are going to do an overnight. We're really just going to focus on Jesus and what he did. And I give you all that, not just to, to sell it, but that's basically kind of what we're going to talk about today. Why I called it Cornerstones is because, and I'll focus more on this, on our death of Christ service. Really the cross is the cornerstone to our faith. Okay, without, without the cross, you don't have the resurrection. Without 
without the cross, you don't have salvation. You don't have forgiveness of sin. Now the resurrection is, is an immensely important event. I'm not downplaying that. But without the cross, you don't have that. And without the cross, all the prophecies, most of the prophecies for Jesus besides his birth, are about the cross. So we're going to really focus on the cross. But it won't be just about that every week. We're going to focus on Jesus' last week. But we're going to spread it out over a 13 week period. So it'll be really cool. Um, come and join us for that. Now today, let's see. Brandon, will you go to the next slide for me? All right. <laughs> it's not kid time again. I promise. How many have heard the story of the three little pigs? All right. Everyone's heard the story of three little pigs, right? All right. Not necessarily one of my favorite stories, but what's interesting about this story is as I was kind of processing this and, and how the Lord wanted me to lead today. I thought about the three little pigs and what interested me was that they all chose their own way of building their houses. Okay? So the first little pig, he chose what? Straw. straw. Okay, he chose straw. Okay. Obviously he wasn't an engineer. Um, <laughs> So, but you know, you can't blame him for that, you know, if he, if he wasn't schooled on how to be an engineer. But what I thought about the first little pig was possibly the first little pig would be like unbelievers. Okay? They build our house on something that isn't solid. Something that isn't going to stand. Okay? They build our house on worldly things. They build a spiritual house on worldly things. Things that aren't uh, strong like, like our Lord, our Savior, like Jesus Christ. And what happens when the enemy comes to a spiritual house that's built out of straw or built out of things that aren't, aren't righteous. The enemy comes, the wolf comes, he huffs, he puffs, and what happens to the house? That's right. And then he's free praying for the enemy, for the adversary, right? So, let's not be like the first little piggy. Okay, the second little piggy used what? He used wood, that's right. Okay, a little bit smarter, okay, maybe not an engineer, but, but he knows wood is uh, more supportive then straw, maybe he witnessed what happened with the first little piggy and said, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. So, but I look at the second little piggy as unsaved Christians. Okay? We, we are Christians because we go to church, or we're Christians because um, once in a while we, we pick up a Bible, but we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have religion. Okay. So even though the house is, is a little stronger, the wolf comes, the enemy comes, the adversary comes. He helps, he helps, what happens to the house? It blows down. And the uh, second little piggy is devoured by the enemy. Not a good thing, right? And so, then we look at the third little piggy. The third little piggy builds his house out of what? Stones or bricks. Yeah, we'll go with stone just simply because we're talking about cornerstone today. So he builds his, his house out of stone. Maybe he did see that the other piggies, it, it didn't work. Maybe he was an engineer. Whatever the case, he builds his house out of stone. Now, his house isn't perfect, is it? No. no. But the foundation is solid, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. But we're not perfect, and our spiritual houses aren't perfect. But we have access to a solid foundation. Okay. So, so when the enemy came, he huffed and he puffed, he huffed and he puffed, he huffed and he puffed. You know what happened? The house stood, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Because he had a solid foundation. He had built his house on the run, one rock that won't crumble. On the one rock that is solid, and that's Jesus Christ, amen. So, so I just kind of thought that would be a neat introduction to, to kind of what we're talking about today. We're going to jump through scriptures today. Um, I've never taught a topical message, and I really don't think it could be considered topical. However, we are going to hit different parts of the Bible. We're going to hit Old Testament, we're going to hit New Testament, and we're going to hit Gospels. But we're going to see that there's a common theme here, okay? Um, this, we're going to be in Psalms to begin, which is Psalms 118, 21 through 23. You can go ahead and hit the next slide there, Brandon. And we're going to see what the psalmist prophesied about Jesus and about the early church. And then eventually we're going to jump to the Gospels and see how Jesus verifies what the psalmist has said. And then we're going to jump ahead to Acts and see how one of Jesus' apostles, Peter, re-verified what was said by the psalmist and what was said by Jesus. So it's a, a really great group of scriptures. Um, they're very powerful, and it's just cool to see how God had a plan from day one, and he prophesied it. 
Jesus verified it, and then Peter declared it. And that's what we build our faith on. The gospel that, that Peter preached in Acts. Okay, and we're going to be just hitting a couple verses from it. But I encourage you to read that because it is such a powerful, powerful sermon. Such a powerful message. And it really was the beginning of what we have here, of our church. So let's look at the first verse, Psalm 118, verse 21. And I'll give you guys a second to get there. It will be up on the, on the screen as well. It looks a little different on this screen. I'm not sure why. I guess computers are all different. The, uh, the words all did fit in the box there, I promise. So Psalm 118, verse 21. The psalmist says, I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. When I read this, I thought to myself, we should always be thankful for salvation. If we have nothing else to be thankful for, and if we've heard it again and again and again, it still doesn't allow us to give Jesus enough thanks for salvation. Now, this obviously was before Jesus, but God knew, this, through the Holy Spirit, the psalmist knew, that this was a messianic prophecy, and that we would have Jesus who would come and provide us with that salvation, provide us with that unconditional love, and provide us with that foundation that we need. So, I just want us to focus on how blessed we are to truly have a Messiah who would sacrifice, but a God who would allow His Son to be sacrificed for us. So let us always thank God for our salvation. That is our cornerstone. That is our foundation. And, and that's what we are focusing on today and through this Easter resurrection season. Verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Obviously, uh, this is going to be something you're going to hear in every, uh, every section here is the cornerstone. Once again, the psalmist is predicting this here. So God's people are who? Were who at that time? The Jews. Israel. Right? Okay. They prayed for hundreds of years for a Messiah to come. They wanted a Messiah who was going to save them. Okay? But when the Messiah came, they didn't recognize him. He fulfilled the prophecies. He healed. He preached the gospel. He did miracles. But they still didn't recognize him. He was their chief cornerstone. But they didn't recognize him. Let us not be guilty of not recognizing him our cornerstone, when God talks to us, when we hear Jesus' voice, whether it's in prayer, whether it's through preaching, whether it's through worship, whether it's through teaching in the classes that we had today. Let us not be guilty of what Israel was guilty of at that time, and that is rejecting the very Savior that they had been promised and that they had prayed for. So, so let us not be guilty of that. Let us be willing to accept our cornerstone, our Savior. Verse 23, this was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. See, Jesus would have to die for our sins, and this was God's plan. And oftentimes we see the, the passion or Jesus' death and crucifixion and the scourging as something horrible. And absolutely it was in the sense of what he had to go through physically and spiritually. Well, let us look at it as something beautiful. Because without that, Scripture wouldn't have been fulfilled. And we wouldn't have everlasting life. And we wouldn't have, more importantly, forgiveness of our sins. Because it was the blood that Jesus shed on that cross that was the atonement for our sins. Without the, the lamb being led to the slaughter, the perfect spotless lamb, we would not have salvation. We would be easy to pray for the enemy. Amen. Without the cell, without Jesus, without the rock, what are our houses going to be built out of? Our spiritual houses. Straw and wood. And when the enemy comes, what's going to happen? That's right. We're going to be devoured. Our house will fall and we're going to be devoured. But let's be thankful that Jesus supplied that foundation for us. We do have the ability to have a foundation that's going to stand no matter 
what the enemy brings. Rachel said earlier, demons have to flee at the name of Jesus Christ. So nothing the enemy can bring to us will break that foundation. Nothing. But we have a choice whether to use that as our foundation or not to. And, and so many times, unfortunately, those who do have spiritual houses that collapse, it's typically because we build our foundation on something other than Jesus Christ. Amen. So we see the Old Testament, and we see the Holy Spirit guided the author of Psalms to, to give us a prophecy of what would come. Let's jump to the Gospels. We're going to jump to Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 and 44. And with the exception of the Jesus said to them, everything here are everything we're going to hear are words from Jesus himself. <laughs> Not only did Jesus share, he actually admitted that he was quoting this scripture from the Psalms. Verse 42, as Jesus said to them, have you ever read the scripture? The stone in which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. See, God already had a plan for his chief cornerstone, and we know what that was. That was Jesus Christ. And Jesus here was speaking... And in the audience listening were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, what we call the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders at the time. Okay? Now, they had relied on themselves to be the spiritual rock. They had built a kingdom of greed and unrighteousness to be the foundation for their people. That's not what God had planned. God had Jesus planned to be the foundation, not religious leaders. So Jesus is sharing with them, hey, the psalmists and the prophets have already said that I'm going to be this chief cornerstone. Why have you set yourself up to be the chief cornerstone when I'm the chief cornerstone? They had put themselves, their, their love for greed and their love for righteousness above even their love for God because it was all about self was all about power. And here comes along this radical rabbi who claims to be the Messiah, who threatens everything they've built, everything that they've set up for themselves, everything that they have, um, have made important, the greed, the money, the power, because that's what it was about. They had the highest, Jesus told them clearly, you have the highest, the, the most praised seats in the synagogues, you have the highest places, you walk around with your phylacteries, uh, large, so everyone can see how great you are. You dress like you're better than everyone else. They've built themselves up to be prideful, bigger than God. Jesus called them brood of vipers. He called them sons of the sons of Satan. Okay, and they had built their spiritual house on their own greed and on their own desires. And Jesus is going to make it very clear what happens when we do that. What happens when we build our spiritual houses on our own desires and our selfishness? That's right. It's the same thing that happened to the first and the second little piggy, right? It comes collapsing down when the enemy comes and we become devout. Well, Jesus doesn't pull any punches here in the next verse. He says, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to another nation, bearing the fruits of it. Amen, that's right. A wise man once said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And this could not be more true with the Sanhedrin. And Jesus is making it very clear here. And, and, and uh, we're not just picking on them because we are guilty of this ourselves. So let us thank ourselves how many times have we built our spiritual house on something other than the rock that's more important to us. Uh, Jesus says, it will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. We're going to focus a little bit more on that nation later. But he's basically telling them and us that even if we have this wonderful mansion that we've built, that's, that's beautiful, that has all the amenities, and I'm not talking a physical house, I'm talking our spiritual house. We built ourselves up. Maybe we're rich, maybe we're successful, whatever the case may be. If it's built on something other than Jesus Christ, 
It's worthless. It's worthless. In this world, it may be worth something. But in the next world, it's, it's not worth a thing. I, I don't know if the pastor has said this, but I think he has said this before. Have you ever seen uh, a U-Haul truck following a hearse? Doesn't happen. You can't take any of that stuff with you. And if we spend so much time focusing on the material things and the things that aren't righteous, and we focus on those things and not on Jesus Christ, Everything we have here is going to collapse. We're going to be devoured by the enemy. But that's why we have Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. They had rejected him. And the adversary was there. And he was ready to steal away the great nation of Israel. God's chosen people. The nation that God created. The enemy was waiting. He was ready. He was hoping they would be selfish. He was hoping they would be self-righteous. He was hoping they would rely on themselves, and they did. And what happened? They got taken away. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, it was taken away. Because they rejected the chief cornerstone, and they put themselves up as the cornerstone themselves. That's where we run into problems. You know, we are, in, as in nature, we are selfish people. I, myself, personally have struggled with, with selfishness my whole life. It's been something that that I've had to deal with, I've had to work with, I've had to fight against. And it was one of the hardest things for me to give up when I finally decided to give my life to the Lord was not being about me, but it being about God. And, and we're, we're, by nature, we're selfish people, some more than others, me being one of them. But the only way we can truly have a spiritual foundation that is solid, that is on a rock, is if we humble ourselves and put God first. Amen? God's more important, right? It's God's show. Isn't that what uh, Jim said last I mean, um, yeah, he said last week? He said it's God's show, not ours, right? We're not the stars, right? We're not the stars. God is the star of this show. Uh, verse 44, And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but whomever it falls will grind him to powder. This was a direct warning from God through the Son of God, and it was very clear to anyone who had built their spiritual foundation on something or someone other than Jesus Christ that they would suffer this punishment. This warning is for us as well. Jesus was speaking specifically to a crowd and specifically to the Sanhedrin, but it's in the gospel for a reason. You know, the Holy Spirit encouraged Matthew to put it in this gospel for a reason. Not to be looked over or not to be think, not to think that that wasn't just meant for us, it was just meant for some bad guys at the time. This is something that's meant for us. So important that we remember who our rock is, who our foundation is, just like the kid story then. Okay? I, I wasn't sure what, what we were going to do for kid time, and, and all of a sudden that, that parable came to my mind. I was like, that's great. It relates perfectly to this story. Uh, let, let's do it. So let us heed Jesus' warning here. If we don't heed the warning from the psalmist, let us heed Jesus' warning. It makes it very clear that we have one option and one option only for a spiritual foundation, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's not pick something else. We see what happens when we pick other things. So now we're going to jump to Acts. And we're in Acts 4, verses 10 through 12. And I promise you won't have to jump around anymore. And I'll give you a second to get to Acts. Again, like I said, if you haven't ever read Peter's sermon, I suggest you read it. Right after the baptism of the Holy Spirit fell in, and all the, the apostles spoke in tongues and shared the gospel, Jesus, I'm sorry, Peter preached a message that was so powerful. It, it was a message that would be the foundation of... Um, not the cornerstone, the foundation of the early church, the message itself, which was the message of Jesus Christ. So on, on the day of Pentecost, Peter revealed a deeper meaning. We've heard the prophecy from the psalmist. We've heard a prediction from Jesus Christ himself. And now we're going to hear a declaration from Peter. So verse 10, 
Peter says, then know this, and he's speaking to all the men present there. There were men from all nations, but there were Jews there as well. Then know this, you and all people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Now, Peter and John had just healed a man in Jesus' name. Okay? They made it very clear that it wasn't them, that it was Jesus who healed this man. They were punished for that. Okay? Because it was against the law at that time to do anything in Jesus' name. And they were told, don't you ever speak that man's name again. They wouldn't even use Jesus' name. Don't you ever speak that man's name again. You can leave, but don't ever speak that man's name again. And then someone came and asked, by whose power was this man healed? Right after Peter and John were ordered never to use that man's name again, they said it was in Jesus Christ's name that this man was healed. They knew they were going to be persecuted. They knew what they were saying was going to be against the law at the time. But they would not deny Jesus Christ. They would not take the credit themselves. They would not build a spiritual house on Peter and on John. They built their spiritual house on Jesus Christ. They loved their Lord and Savior. They gave their Lord and Savior all the credit. They gave Jesus all the credit. They didn't care what the consequences were. They weren't going to cave. Their house, their foundation was solid. They had the confidence that the, first, the third little piggy had. He might have been a little nervous when he saw the enemy coming. But I think in his heart, he knew, you know what, I got a good house here. This house is going to stand. I got a solid foundation. And I'm sure Peter and John were a little nervous, but they knew who they had, and they knew where their foundation was, and they knew how solid he was, and they knew how much he loved them, and they knew he wouldn't break, and they knew he wouldn't crumble, and they knew that they would stand strong because they had Jesus Christ. Amen? So, with the wolf came, they wouldn't have to worry about it. If the enemy came, they wouldn't have to worry about anything. They were safe. Doesn't mean he's not going to come, because he is going to come. And he is going to attack. And he is going to do everything he can to get us to fear. To maybe run out of the house. To run off of the foundation. To run off of Jesus Christ. He's going to try. He's going to try to pull us away. That's how he gets us. That's how he attacks us. That's what he does. Okay? But as long as we are standing on Jesus Christ, we are protected. Just like Rachel said, even at the name of Jesus, even who will flee? Even the demons, even the enemies. That's right. His name is more powerful. So verse 11, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we've heard it in the Gospels. We've heard it in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms. Now we're hearing Peter verifying it. Obviously, Peter was paying attention. We know Peter made a lot of mistakes, but in this particular instance, he was paying attention, and he got it right. Amen? Just like all of us, right? Sometimes it takes us a little longer than it should. But once we rely on Jesus Christ, then we finally get it right for the most part. Even after this, Peter made some mistakes. We know he, he made some mistakes. He thought that, you know, he, he had trouble preaching to Gentiles. He was kind of focused on the Jews. And God had to smack him around again and say, you know, no. no my, my gospel is for everyone, not just for Jews. So, rejected by men, women, and religious leaders, just as the psalmist had predicted, Jesus would become the cornerstone. For a new nation. What is that new nation? Us. Us who? That's right. Or the church. Right? We refer to sometimes as the big C church. Not a denomination. Not a building. Not a cult. Okay? A group of believers who are imperfect, striving for perfection. One day we will receive perfection in our everlasting life. But we know we have a perfect model to follow. Amen? And who's that perfect model? Jesus Christ. That's right. So that is the nation. And that includes Gentiles and Jews. Anyone who claims or believes and has put their faith in Jesus Christ is part of that new nation. Aren't we lucky that Jesus came and opened that door... For not just Jews, but for Gentiles. Amen. Amen. Because, you know, originally the, the original covenant was, was for Jews. Now we know, even back in Genesis 12, 3, God said, you know, for all nations. So we knew it was prophetic. 
But at one time, the covenant didn't include Gentiles. But Jesus changed all that and allowed us. I don't think there's any Jew, Jewish people in here today. Toby's not here, right? So uh, we're all Gentiles who allowed us to be able to have access to that chief cornerstone. Without whom, we can't be safe from the enemy. Amen? Okay, we're, we're, we're close to being done. Hang in with me. So verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind which we must be saved. If you ever want to do an altar call, just share that verse. Amen? An awesome verse. There is no substitute for Jesus Christ. The world has, is, and will continue to try to replace Jesus Christ. The world will continue to try to make us as believers, or even potential believers, believe that it is not necessary to rely on Jesus Christ. That is what the enemy does. He uses the world to try to convince us that Jesus Christ is not necessary. That's one of his strongest weapons. But we are to be stronger than that. Amen? And we can be stronger than that. Amen? And how can we be stronger than that? With who? With Jesus Christ. That's right. With Jesus Christ. Because we're not going to build our house out of straw. We're not going to build our house out of wood. Because Jesus is the cornerstone. So we're going to build our house out of stone. We're going to be like the third little piggy. A little bit smarter than the rest. Committed to God. Committed to Jesus Christ. Committed to the to the Word of God. We're going to be committed to having Jesus Christ as our chief cornerstone. Amen? So I'm going to share some closing thoughts, and then we're going to share a closing scripture. We are going to have a time of prayer before we do communion today. The ministry team is going to come up after the closing thoughts here, and we're going to open the altar to anybody who wants to come up and A, seek salvation, which is found in no one else other than the name of Jesus Christ. Or just to, to maybe if you feel like, you know, I'm not worthy to receive communion today. The, Paul, strip, Paul makes it very clear that we should, we should check our hearts and see if we're worthy to take communion today. We would, you know, communion is for everyone. Jesus didn't die for just a certain group of people. But we also can't take communion unworthily. So we're going to open the altars for if you have prayers for healing, if you have prayers for others. If you have prayers for yourself, if you want to seek salvation, we're going to open up the altars for that, and then we're going to share communion. But I just want to share this thought with you real quick, and it just sums up everything we've talked about. The only way a structure can withstand the sometimes brutal elements of a storm is to have a solid foundation. The cornerstone is the most important part of this foundation. If the cornerstone holds, so will the structure. We also face storms that sometimes bring brutal conditions, but we have access to a cornerstone that will never fail. But will we use it? Would you mind coming to playing some music for us while we pray and invite the ministry team up? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us the Bible, which verifies itself, which validates itself. Father God, we heard passages from the Old Testament. We heard passages from the Gospels. We heard passages from the New Testament. And everything lined up exactly the way you had it planned. It doesn't contradict itself. It doesn't leave us any doubt with who is our cornerstone, Jesus Christ. So, Father God, let us today seek you and seek Jesus Christ to be our chief cornerstone. Let us not rely on anything else. Let us not rely on the world or money or goods or material things or, or anything like that. Let us rely on you and on you alone. Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services, Sunday School for All Ages at 9 a.m., Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. 
During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.